Remember, <laughs> Dos Equis beer. <laughs> I'd like to thank James Taylor and the Heartland Institute for this opportunity to speak on global warming and human health effects, and especially Dr. Dunn for his generous advice. <laughs> global warming does not pose a threat to human health, in spite of the many exaggerated claims advanced for increased human illness and death. I'll show that the projected warming will decrease mortality from all causes, including cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, and infectious diseases, <clears throat> such as malaria and other vector-borne diseases. If it does occur, it will benefit humans. It will increase our wealth, improve our health, and increase our longevity. The increased atmospheric CO2 of 100 parts per million that has occurred since the start of the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago has been a huge benefit to human health. It has increased the mean yields of wheat by 60 percent, of fruits and melons by 33 percent, of gooms by 63 percent, and of vegetables by 51 percent, while increasing their protein and antioxidant or vitamin C content. Any increase in CO2 levels in the future will increase crop yields per unit of land area, per unit of nutrient applied, and per unit of water used. Speculations on the impacts of global warming are guided more <clears throat> by the need <clears throat> to satisfy a political agenda than they are based on rigorous scientific methodology. The hypothetical claims of indirect harm from extreme weather events <clears throat> such as extreme heat, droughts, floods, hurricanes, and cyclones have been refuted by Ender Golklani. Global warming allegedly increases the frequency and intensity of these events, but Golklani shows that morbidity and mortality from them has declined globally by 93 percent since the 1920s. In fact, the bulk of weather-related deaths over the 28-year period from 1979 to 2006 were caused by extreme cold. <clears throat> Altogether, these extreme weather events contribute only 0.06 percent to uh, global and U.S. mortality, and this has been steadily decreasing since the 1970s. Golklenny concludes that wealth, technology, and human and social capital are more important than any global warming in determining mortality from these events. Thomas G. Moore showed that mortality from cold in winter in the U.S. is seven times greater than summer mortality from heat waves. W.R. Keating and the Euro Winter Group found similar results for Europe. The mechanism for this may be hemoconcentration or thickening of blood in cold weather causing sludging of the bloodstream to the heart, brain, and lungs, resulting in increased heart attacks, strokes, and pneumonia. If the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's estimate that the temperature will raise by four degrees by 2100 indeed occurs, Howard Maccabee estimates that the net benefit in the United States could be six to 12 million lives saved. This agrees with Bjorn Lomberg's estimate of 170 million fewer deaths worldwide. As Maccabee points out, since warming will be a benefit to health and longevity in the U.S., there's no mandate for the regulation of CO2 by the Environmental Protection Agency under the Clean Air Act. Global warming has been described as the greatest threat facing mankind but the policies proposed to address global warming are in fact a much greater threat. Many environmentalists and like-minded politicians have proposed spending trillions of dollars to reduce anthropogenic greenhouse gases. But one study found that reducing these emissions would result in 33,800 to 67,000 excess deaths annually between 2008 and 2012 because of the loss of wealth <coughs> squandered to reduce these emissions. Spending a small percentage of these billions of dollars on basic infrastructure improvements for water, sewage and waste management, nutrition, and housing would be a vastly more effective way to reduce disease and improve life expectancy. 
exaggerated and unsupported claims about the importance of global warming also misdirect the world's public health priorities and scarce resources away from immediate, real, and urgent health problems and will only increase poverty and curtail the hydrocarbon-fueled technology that has already resulted in, in enormous actual reductions in such mortality. For example, hunger's contribution to global mortality is 20 times greater than that estimated for global warming. As James Taylor has noted, malnutrition is caused by a lack of food, not a lack of cold weather. <clears throat> the forced switch to biofuels use has been called a crime against humanity. It has been embraced by the International Panel on Climate Change and by many environmental groups. But it increased the prices of all crops as well as animal products and led to the 2008 food riots in the developing countries of Haiti, Bangladesh, Egypt, and Mozambique. In addition, the water required to produce biofuels-derived energy is 70 to 400 times larger than that for other energy sources. According to Goklani, the increased use of biofuels may have caused at least 192,000 excess deaths and placed an additional 32 million people in absolute poverty in 2010 alone. One of the many claims made by the International Panel on Climate Change and others is the expanded geographic ranges and increased incidences of vector-borne diseases, such as those spread by mosquitoes and ticks. Mosquitoes transmit the protozoan disease malaria and viral diseases such as yellow fever, dengue fever, and the viruses that cause the encephalitides, West Nile, St. Louis, La Crosse, Eastern Equine and Western Equine encephalitis. Ticks carry viral diseases such as Colorado tick fever, and bacterial diseases such as Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease, tick-borne relapsing fever, and tularemia. But Dr. Paul Ryder of the Institute Paris, in, I'm sorry, yeah, Institute of uh, the Institute Pasteur in Paris, and many others have refuted these claims, as he shows they ignore the ecology and behavior of humans, and the ecology and behavior of the vector. The natural history and ecology of both vector and humans are very complex, which makes accurate computer modeling extremely unlikely. Those making these claims also ignore the classic components of science, unbiased observation and systematic experimentation. In addition, they ignore the massive amount of pertinent data from history that counters their claims. As Ryder terms it, quote, the rich heritage of literature, unquote. He shows, for example, that the decline of malaria in Europe generally occurred without control measures during a period of climate warming. Malaria is the infectious disease that throughout history has killed more humans than any other. Predictions are common that over the coming decades, tens or even hundreds of millions of excess cases of malaria will occur and that the disease, both the vectors and the pathogens, will extend to higher latitudes and higher altitudes. The blame is placed on the activities of the richest nations. And the scientific, as well as the popular presses, parrot these deceptive claims. The writer points out that malaria does not require tropical temperatures. It was common in the Little Ice Age from the 16th to the 18th centuries. And he notes that major epidemics occurred from Poland to eastern Siberia in the 19th and early 20th centuries. For example, because of the massive social unrest and e economic disruption of the 1920s in the Soviet Union, a malaria pandemic occurred. Official figures from 1923 to 1925 listed 16.5 million cases with more than 600,000 deaths. England was free of malaria by the 1950s, and in 1975, the World Health Organization declared Europe to be free of malaria. By 1977, 83% of the world's population lived in regions free from malaria or where control activities were in place. The control effort was limited only in sub-Saharan Africa. But now, malaria is again common in tropical and subtropical Asia, in many parts of Central America, in some Mediterranean countries, and in many of the republics once part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. But this is due to ecological changes from human activities, disruptions from war and civil strife, and failure to use DDT. It is not due to global warming. 
Today, more than a million deaths occur needlessly each year from malaria, 90% of these in Africa, in poor pregnant women, and in children under five years of age. In, Af in Africa, a child dies of malaria every 30 seconds. Mosquito control using DDT is the most effective prevention for malaria. It's cheap, effective, and perfectly safe for humans and all wildlife. It both kills and repels mosquitoes. An indoor spraying with DDT twice a year will reduce the incidence of malaria up to 98%. For example, in 1996, South Africa stopped using DDT. At that time, it had total malaria cases under 10,000 and deaths of about 30 annually. But by the year 2000, cases of malaria had increased to 65,000 with 458 deaths annually. After reintroducing DDT, the uh, deaths quickly dropped to 89 per year. So the principal determinants of the prevalence and range of malaria remain politics, economics, and human activities, not global warming. Myron Ebel of the Competitive Enterprise Institute notes that the current policies that ration carbon-based energy do little to slow carbon emissions and um, have enormous costs, costs that harm the poor in the world's poorest nations the most. These policies will consign billions of people to prolonged poverty with its increased incidence of disease and premature death. These poor countries lack the economic and human resources to develop technologies that can cope with real immediate problems. Ebel concludes that the correct approach is not energy rationing, which makes societies poor, but instead enabling the long-term development and transformation of technology by increasing the wealth of developing societies. This approach will result in greater benefits for human health and well-being for a fraction of the cost of any significant emissions reduction. Our fellow humans need and deserve the freedom to create wealth without the shackles of a deceptive hidden socialist agenda that is designed to confiscate and redistribute the wealth created by others. The global warming agenda will only lead to a massive increase in poverty with its accompanying increase in disease and premature death, and it may eventually lead to the destruction of civilization. Thanks to the heroic efforts of those such as Fred Singer, Lord Christopher Monckton, Bjorn Lomborg, Vaclav Klaus, Willie Soon, Joe Bass, and thousands of others, our uh, misinformed and misled public is uh, awakening to the danger. It remains for the public and ultimately for our feckless politicians to respond appropriately to the challenge. Thank you. <laughs>